So um, any, anyways, uh, so this, this is our first online meeting. Uh, Andrew last spoke with us in 2018. Um, we featured him on our Lisp Second, which is our special YouTube meeting on the second Tuesday after the second Tuesday of the month. And um, so I hope you guys all join in on that. And um, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Andrew again, where he'll be talking to us about uh, his language called April. Thanks, Arthur. It's um, great to be with you again, all virtually. It's uh, felt like a lot longer than two years. But um, in any case, I'm here to talk about my April language. As Arthur said, it is a compiler from the APL programming language to Common Lisp. So uh, how many, well, I guess most people are muted, but uh, I know from the last time we spoke that many of you are familiar with APL and the vector language family. But for those of you who aren't, we're going, I'm going to go through a little introduction and then um, talk about APL and how it can fit in a Lisp and why a Lisp developer should um, be interested in it and what, you know, some of the implications moving forward. And then there's uh, some other things we'll discuss. So let's get started. So can you all see my uh, my slides here? I guess you're muted. I'll take that as a yes. But um, anyway, so introducing April, my APL compiler to Common Lisp. So what is April? It is a compiler that allows you to use APL language within Lisp programs. And you can install it from Quick Lisp, just Quick Load April. And then the repository is at this link. So what kind of language is APL? APL in some ways is like Lisp. It's a functional, it has a functional style. It's, you know, can be used for functional type programming. I wouldn't say it's a pure functional language, but then again, nothing really is. It has only a few syntax rules, not quite as few as Lisp. There are, you know, there are some cases beyond a single form, but not too many. Its origin, you know, it, it owes its origins to the mainframes, and it uh, it really was it was a language that was kind of uh, predominantly mainframe in nature, and that's why it uh, didn't take off with some of the more uh, you know, it when the personal computers showed up, it wasn't uh, it wasn't one of you know it it wasn't uh, it didn't ride the wave of C and the other languages that were uh, included with those. So and then it was mathematically influenced. So APL like Lisp started out as an attempt at a special purpose mathematical notation, and it um, grew then into a programming language. But uh, in some other ways, APL is not like Lisp. APL has very terse syntax. It uses, it's really notable for its use of special characters outside the regular ASCII set. And it operates, its, its main focus is operating on arrays as opposed to lists. And APL is usually an interpreted language, not a compiled one. So pictured here is Ken Iverson, the creator of APL. He was a Harvard mathematician he created the language starting in 1957 with his book, A Programming Language. And APL was intended originally to be a more consistent notation for linear algebra. So obviously, mathematical notation has a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of, uh, you know, different styles depending on what kind of math you're doing. He wanted to unify, create a, a kind of a unified standard. And just like John McCarthy in his S expressions and M expressions originally, some of his, some, some students and others realized that his language could be adapted to program computers. So it uh, was first implemented on the IBM System 360 hardware in 1960. And it was used as the basis of a REPL-driven operating system, a lot like the Lisp machines. 
and then IBM made it commercially available starting in 1967 and it used a customized type ball which you see in the picture here for printing APL characters so obviously at this time character sets weren't as standardized as there are now there wasn't an ASCII yet so it didn't seem like such a, a strange choice to make to uh, use the to have this custom character set so it became very popular on the IBM system 360 and 370 mainframes and it uh, it was uh, used a lot in finance insurance scientific computation and APL also had a role in the emergence of personal computing now I just said that it wasn't used in the uh, it, it was kind of left behind by the, the oncoming wave of personal computers, but that's talking about the PC and the, uh, the ones that really, the Apple II and the ones that really came to dominate the market. In the very beginning, there was a, one of the first microcomputers called the MCM70, and it was powered by APL. So it was revolutionary for the time, and it was a lot less expensive than the alternatives. It, it actually took away some market share from IP Sharp and the APL vendors who were selling the language as a time-shared service that you would call into. So unfortunately, mismanagement sank the MCM company. There's a whole book written about that. And the legacy of APL today is the family of vector languages. So these languages like APL have a terse syntax. They focus on operating on arrays or lists. Some of the notable examples are J, A+, and K. Jay was uh, Ken Iverson's attempt at creating an all ASCII APL, and A plus and K were developed by his protege Arthur Whitney, and they're very po they're still most popular within finance and insurance. There's also some use in engineering and graphics. The most commercially successful vector languages, well, you could say vector technology, is KDB plus. It is a product of KX Systems. And they mainly serve the financial sector. They produce this KDB plus. It's a time series database powered by the K programming language. So this is a database for institutions that are ingesting trillions of rows a day. It stores data in a columnar format. That's a bit much to get into for now, but suffice to say it can very fat it can very quickly trawl through and ingest huge amounts of data. So these languages are often used in places where high performance computing is a priority. So Iverson wrote a paper in the while in the in the course of APL development called Notation as a Tool of Thought. And he he pointed out the fact that ha, that using a special lexicon makes it um, unambiguous you, you can well you can really write code in an unambiguous way. It makes it clear what you're doing. These characters you see here are the original APL character set. And when you see these in a piece of code, because they're unique to APL, it's immediately apparent what's going on. So some of the APL, some of these vector languages that are, des that are descended from APL decided to, uh, they decided to abandon the, the custom character set concept and go with ASCII characters but it's hard to map the breadth of operations that you can do in a vector language to ASCII. So even the, the K language in its latest versions has started to bring back some of those, those, uh, those special glyphs. So let's try running some APL. And in Linux, the fastest way to switch into an APL input mode is to run this command here. So that sets it up so that your Windows key becomes a modifier and when you hold down that key, you can press other keys and produce APL characters. So in a moment here, we will see what the APL keyboard looks like. So can you guys all see the, uh, the Emacs here? Is it clear to you? If, if you would like to unmute, that would be great. Yep, it looks good. OK, cool. So this is an instance of GNU APL. Uh, I'm not sure. The edges are slightly cut off, so you might want to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, yeah, the it's cut off in a part where the letters won't show. It's just cutting off like the scroll bar, so you won't you won't see anything spill over into this area at the side. 
But over here on the keyboard, you can see which APL characters are uh, associated with each key. Obviously, the original APL machines had, uh, they came with keyboards imprinted with these keys, and there were actually no lowercase. So the shift key just printed the associated APL character, and your, um, your text was all uppercase. So I'm starting us off with just the GNU APL interpreter. So this isn't April yet, but this will show you kind of how a classical APL works. So I type a number, enter, I get a number. I enter some numbers separated by spaces, and that produces a vector. So APL obviously is the array processing language. It's all about you know working with arrays, reshaping them, and manipulating them in different ways. So I can do mathematical operations like one plus one, but I can also do mathematical operations over vectors. So if I add a scalar to a vector, it will automatically add that to each element of the vector. Approximately two characters on the left edge are being chipped off, which makes a lot of difference right now. Okay. So one, two, three comes back two, three. Thank you. There we go. Thanks for letting me know. So this, all right, so. Yeah, so you can um, do operations over a vector and then the plus sign is one of APL's functional symbols. And the way that a lot of the functions in the APL work are they have both a monadic and a dyadic. Uh, use case. So if I do five minus one, two, three, we get this. If I do just do minus one, two, three, we get this. So when dyadic means that the minus function is being used with two arguments, one on each side, and then in that case, it's, subtra it's subtraction. The monadic use of minus is when you have only characters to this side of it, when you only have a, a value on this side, it becomes a negation function. So it makes the uh, it it makes the argument negative, and then one of APL's uh, most popular functions is iota. So iota nine gives me a vector of numbers from one to nine. Another popular uh, function is the row function. So five row eight gives me a five element vector of eights. I can have a multi I can create a multi dimensional array. by sending a vector of values to row. So this gives me a three by five array of threes. And then if I do three, four row iota nine, it takes the vector of numbers from one to nine and shapes it into a three by four array. Then let's look at another function. Rotate. So what this does is it rotates the array. So the one column, which used to be on the far left, is now rotated, so it's on the right. If I do a negative one rotate, it rotates the other direction. It's notable that in APL, you have this special high minus sign that's used for negative because the minus, the regular minus sign is a function, so you need the high minus to serve as just a negative marker. But uh, lastly, let's look at take function. So this, what I'm doing here is I'm taking the two, a two by two of this original three by four array starting at the top left. I do negative two. It starts instead on the other side. So it starts from the bottom. And then there's the drop, which uh, this drops the uh, the first 
the first row and first column of the array. And if I want to drop the last row and last column of the array, oops, <laughs> wrong character. I want to drop the, the first, the, the first, the last row and column of the array. I send them negative. So this is just a short introduction to some of the array transformations that you can do with APL. So comparing APL to Lisp. Obviously, APL gets a lot more done with very few characters. A f just a few characters in APL can do the job of multiple nested loops in Lisp. But APL has trouble getting outside its comfort zone. I see it as a domain-specific language. It's really a specialized tool for working with arrays of values, characters, or numbers. If you want to, if you want to do symbolic computing, if you want to create more semantic constructs, that's where Lisp really shines. And APL also does not have any macros, and it does not yet have first-class functions. So the answer that I came up with was an alloy of Lisp and APL. It's like literally, as soon as I learned APL, I thought I really want to use this inside of Lisp. You can build, uh, you know, you can build the basic logic and basic the kind of the patterns of meaning within a program using Lisp and then when you want some serious array processing horsepower you jump into APL. So I see it kind of like regular expressions or the the format you know the language used in the, the format command although this one is Turing complete but they're all domain specific tools for really efficiently doing a specific task same way that you use uh, the regexes to you know to transform text, you use this to transform arrays. So let's see the difference that APL makes with a classic example on Waste Game of Life. So let me know if you see the uh, Emacs and you're able to read it. Too small, too blurry. Okay, let me blow up the font here. it now I can make it out but uh, yeah that looks good I'm not sure about other stuff I see it okay cool so here is um here is it, it within the APL, within the April code, there's an implementation of Conway's Game of Life. So this is the classical APL Conway's Game of Life program. This function computes a new generation of life. So if I enter Enter life 3232, it creates a new array for the game of life. And each time I enter life, I produce a new generation. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Conway's game of life is a kind of cellular automata simulation. And basically the rules are 
any cell that has either three or four neighbors will reproduce and create another cell. Any cell that has one or two, either one or two or five or six neighbors will die either of isolation or overcrowding. So with each successive generation, life array transforms. And most languages obviously require several loops to do that, but this is all done in this one piece of code. Basically, what it does is it creates uh, nine permutations of the play field then layers them on top of each other to count the number of neighbors that each cell has. And then it uh, uses a inner... Uh, it uses the, uh, the inner... Yeah, it reduces, it reduces the... Uh, inner product. Yeah, the inner product. It reduces to... Uh, find to eliminate the uh, cells that are dead and then and add the cells that are now living. And then, so this is a classic program, but my addition to the uh, Game of Life program was the printing algorithm. So the, uh, you see here, I, I framed it and I used these uh, Zilda characters. This is an APL character to represent the cells. So the way I did that was I just take this string of characters and then I, so these characters are indexed according to the array of numbers that's passed here. So what I'm doing here is I'm just, uh, I'm putting threes and fours on the sides of this binary array. Then I put uh, twos on the top and, no, I put ones on the top. I put fives on the bottom Or no, I, create, I put twos on the top, fives on the bottom, threes and fours on the sides, and then I index it with this string. So that entire printing process is also accomplished in just a few characters of APL. So that's the difference that it can make when you use APL within Lisp. So like I said, as soon as I learned about APL, I started wondering if it could be compiled to Lisp. Both languages are, uh, you know, I, I see them as illuminating different parts of the programming idea space. And there's a lot of commonalities. In fact, um, APL, some of its algorithms were actually imported into Lisp when uh, Common Lisp and some of the predecessors were being developed. And the, uh, the they both use row major uh, they both use uh, row, major, row major counting of array elements. They uh, you can they both uh, kind of you know they have a an, they have an order of operations that works a similar way. So I thought if the two were united, what could be possible? So going about this, this was my first real compiler project. And the Lexer and compiler went through several stages of development. I would say that Every significant part of April has been implemented at least twice, and the core parts have been implemented three or four times. So what I ended up doing was I created, I, I, my, the foundation I set down was a package called VEX. If you look in the April package, you'll see VEX. And VEX is actually a tool for building uh, vector languages. It's kind of language agnostic. It's intended that you could build a K or a, a J with it, as well as an APL. Uh, that's, that's not feasible yet, but you, it, with enough extension and generalization that you could do that. So I started with this framework and then I built April on top of that. And I'm, I use a parsing engine called MaxPC, which was created by this guy named Max Rottenkalber. So it's very useful tool for building parsers and Lisp. And then the array operations library was my starting point for doing a, a lot of my array work. So that's, um, I think the original maintainer has stepped down and another person has taken that over. But it took about five months total development time starting in late 2017 to uh, late 2019 was when most of the intensive work happened. But there's been some this year as well. So there's uh, obviously still ongoing, but I've, um, 
I've reached a lot of the targets that I set at first. So let's see how APL gets compiled to Lisp. So this is the output when you pass this compile only option to APL. This is the output that you get. So there's some kind of boilerplate here that uh, handles the output and sets some of the kind of the internal variables. And then I the the compiled code uses a lot of these uh, these macros like APL call, which calls this plus function onto the vector of one, two, three, and one. So this is a bit more complicated compilation, but this calls the, uh, you can see the, the plus five plus the row function, the shape taking the three, four, and then the uh, iota nine as arguments. And then this function here is actually what the row compiles to. So like Lambda, Lambda Omega Alpha, if you macro expand it, that's just a shorthand for lambda with with arguments called omega and alpha. But I use a bunch of shorthands in the compiled output so that it's semi-human readable. Obviously, the uh, you know the forking kind of structure of APL is easy to implement in Lisp, but it's it's complicated to read. But the, the intention is that uh, a human could read this and make some sense out of it. And then the symbols here, these don't actually do anything. They are just there uh, to you know, show you what function has been called that's being uh, expanded here. Can you show the expansion of, a, uh, of an APL call? Yeah. Invocation? One of the simpler ones. So it calls this, uh, yeah, the, it, it calls this thing in here on APL call iota of nine. So to see an even simpler one, So yeah, just lambda omega count to omega and index origin of nine. And that index origin is the number here. So an interesting property of APL, if you noticed when I was doing that iota, is that it started counting from one. So in APL, unlike most languages, you actually count from one a lot of the time. And But the any time you have a program that could start counting from one number or another, you use the index origin as an implicit argument. So this index origin, you can change it by assigning you can assign index origin to zero and that will change your index origin and then after you enter that you can uh, you, you can start counting from zero. So that's a notable feature of APL. And then there's several other options within April for um, configuring the index origin and setting it in a workspace so that it can, it can persist at a certain value if you want it to be other than one. So looking at the vector language family today, it's um, interesting in that it is generally a lot more proprietary than some of the other language families. The leading lights of vector languages are all proprietary right now. So the most popular APL implementation is produced by a company called Dialog in the UK. 
and they have like they're they're kind of the they inherited some of the technology from IP Sharp, which was one of the big time sharing APL service providers, and uh, some of the the others that were some of the other APLs that were in development back in the 80s and 90s, and they're pretty much head and shoulders above all the others. There's a, the, the most popular open source implementation is GNU APL, which I showed you just before. That was the one I was using through Emacs, and GNU is based on the IBM APL too. So that was IBM's APL. So to give a little history, Iverson left Harvard to work at IBM, and APL was an IBM language for from the start, but eventually others started to develop their own APLs, and then IBM basically stopped the development of their language in the late 80s with APL2. So IBM's APL is actually still for sale. You can still buy it from them, and but its um, its its development is basically frozen since around 1987. So a lot of the features that have come to APL since that time are missing from GNU APL because the developer's goal with that was simply to, uh, to, to follow IBM APL2. He has added some new features, like he's added an ability to send axes to a function, but um, that's about it. So dialog is pretty much where it's at in terms of uh, APL right now. And then um, like the most popular vector language, K, as I mentioned, the the uh, driver of KDB is also proprietary. So speaking there of- There is an open source K3 implementation called Kona. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm aware, of, I'm aware of Kona. So kind of like with APL, there's some, there's some open source copies, but the, the leading languages are proprietary. But there's actually been several attempts now at uh, duplicating K. Actually, a friend of mine is also writing his own uh, K interpreter. But uh, so the original APL systems had one means of input, the keyboard, and the output was the printer. So if you wanted to, to put data in, you typed it in, and anything you got out of one of those machines came out of the, the printer. So that was obviously, that was a very mainframey way of thinking. But this is kind of persisted in the design of APL interpreters. So the connecting an APL to an outside workspace has traditionally been kind of tricky. Basically, you had to have a plug-in to, uh, to your interpreter to support whatever external thing you were talking to. And if you're using a proprietary system like Dialog, then uh, if they don't have a plug-in, you're pretty much out of luck. So on the original APL machines, all the software was written through the REPL. In fact, there's actually, like, the REPLs in the original APL systems have, uh, a pr like, a function editor mode where the, you know, the, the, the syntax and the, you know, the way it works is slightly different and you're editing a function. It sounds quite strange from today's standpoint, but it was, uh, it was pretty intuitive in the days of line editors. And writing inline functions not using the function editor was considered a big leap for APL. And even today, uh, talking to Dialog, there's, they, they're saying, you know, they, they talk about how they're kind of exploring the new frontier of IDEs and the idea of writing software in a, a program external to the interpreter. This is considered a novel thing in APL because traditionally, all the software has been written inside the interpreter and the idea of loading an external source file is, um, is a strange thing to them. But uh, to show real quick how APL handles arrays, let's jump back to Emacs, or how APL handles functions. So first let's look at a variable. So here what I'm doing is I assign 5 to f, and then the diamond character is like a, it's a, like a line break, the same as a line break, and then I add it to 1, 2, 3. But I can also make a function, f, v plus omega, three divided by omega, three 
plus omega. So the omega character used in APL, when you use it in a function, it signifies the, the right argument because omega comes after. Now, if I give it an alpha as well, then the alpha stands for the left argument because the alpha comes before. So the I mentioned APL functions are almost always monadic or dyadic. Some dialects have niladic functions that take no arguments. I don't. I have not implemented anything like that yet. But uh, so you have either monadic or dyadic. So that means that uh, you only have two potential two potential arguments to a function. So your if you if you need multi if you need more arguments than that you have to uh, combine them or vectorize them as one of your arguments and then decompose that in your function. But so this is basically it. So you know brackets make a function, you assign them, and then you use them the same way you'd use any of the other glyphs. Now I have uh, expanded a bit on that in my implementation of APL, but we'll get to that later. So a major difference with April is the ease of moving data in and out. Lisp obviously has a lot of faculties for connecting and um, interacting with different databases and other APIs. So any data that you can ingest in that way and format as an array, you can pass right into April. So let's look at how we uh, deal with external data in April. So if I make this vector 1, 2, 3, and then I do April C, and I enter a function with an omega, that April C mean stands for April call. So it will call this function on this argument. Now let's say that I want to put an alpha in there. The second argument is actually the alpha. So the order of arguments when you use April C is omega alpha. It may sound kind of confusing, but that's all. The, that's the way that they're always implemented. Because so, because you must always have an omega, but you may not have an alpha. The omega comes first when you're doing April C. So I was going to ask if that's connected to the uh, the right to left evaluation in in April and left to right in list, but apparently not. No. Yeah, and the other yeah the other thing I should uh, mention about APL. For those who don't know, is that April is that APL evaluates from right to left. So the first so this would not evaluate this way in uh, you know traditionally in mathematics with your order of operations, but in APL, there is no or the only there is no order of operations according to function. The order of operations is just right to left. So nine times three is evaluated first, then one is added to the result. But to change that, if you put parentheses around this, then it will you know it evaluates nine and then the multiplier, and then it will preemptively evaluate what's inside these parentheses. And give you this result. So, like I said, APL has a few more grammatical uh, conventions than Lisp. I've shown you functions. I've shown you uh, order of operations, but that's about it. Uh, when you get down to it, it's just uh, very simple how these functions and operators are combined. And then April APL also has, as well as functions, it has the concept of an operator. So the slash is the reduction operator. So what this means is reduce the numbers one to nine by addition. So you're reducing whatever comes after by the function that hap that is uh, put over here. So an operator is something that changes a function or transforms a function and creates a new function that is then applied to the argument. So operators go a lot deeper than this, but this is uh, as much as we'll say for now. 
Does the operator look like a higher order function from the Lisp side? Can you substitute your very own Lisp function? Uh, from the Lisp side, the operator is actually, well, they're macros. So if you want to understand how April's oper functions and operators are implemented, the, the real core of the language is the spec.lisp in April. So this specify vex idiom, I mentioned that the vex library is used as a kind of built a tool for constructing vector languages. So this specify idiom, April, it gives me, you know, some grammar functions, these documentation profiles, utility functions, like, uh, where is it? Yeah, this is the function that in this is the utility that enumerates all the different characters that can be used as new lines. So I mentioned that the diamonds are new lines and then the new line and return characters. So, but a lot of your, you know, language utilities are here. And then after this is all the functions. So these are all the functions in the language. So most of these, you know, you don't see the whole function definition here. That's located like in the library.lisp. library.lisp and also the APLS package, but you have these. And then after the functions, you have the operators. And the operators, uh, they're basically, they're macros. They take the, uh, fun they take the function code that gets fed to them during compilation and they produce something else. So in APL wise, they are higher order functions. Those higher order functions are generated by a macro that takes in the code uh, for, that was compiled for those functions and then transforms it into something else. Yeah. Thanks. One of the irritations of, of APL is that you could write your own functions, but they're not first class because you can't operate on them. You can't use operators on them. Yes. Now, one of... One of my later goals is to define, is to, is to implement a variant of APL with first class functions. So in that case, the way it's probably going to work is something like this. Let's say you have function gets pre plus omega. So if we have this function, if we do one, Function one, two, three, that's just going to be a vector of function one, two, and three. There will be a colon, a special kind of a special, um, special form or special glyph in this case, the colon. And if there's a colon coming after a function, then it gets applied to what comes after it. So if you want to write an inline function, so in APL, you can write inline functions. So writing this in, in classical APL would apply this function to the things that come after it. But using the colon, you'd have to put you have to put the colon after it in order to apply it. Otherwise, you're making a vector of this and the numbers. This would be substantially easier to implement, actually, uh, in in common Lisp. Right now I have to do bookkeeping for what's a function and what's an operator. As I'll, I'll mention a little while, that's one of the barriers to writing an APL compiler. But that's, uh, you know, that's something down the road I'm looking forward to to build uh, out first class functions in APL. I talked to Dialog about it and they said, uh, well, their, their interests are in other areas. They, they kind of think that it's not, uh, first class functions aren't needed in APL. So compared to Dialog now, April has just about all of the, the core lexical functions and operators that Dialog does. There's a few exceptions, a few, uh, there's some like tools for, like there's some tools for index processing of arrays that I don't have yet. And then the bulk of what I'm lacking from Dialog is all of the system functions they have. So with them, their APL is monolithic. 
So it's an interpreter. It, uh, it has to interact. If you're doing any kind of system interaction or talking to external tools, you have to do it within the APL. So they've obviously put a lot more of those tools in. I don't need that because I can just use the, the faculties of LISP and then get that data formatted as an array and then feed it into April. But as far as the, the core functions go, I've, I've, got, I've implemented just about everything they have. So it's uh, quite far ahead of um, GNU APL in that regard. So let's talk about um, what did I develop along the way and learn about array programming with LISP? So there's the, you know, there's the infamous uh, quote about how any software system that sufficiently evolved will turn into a buggy implementation of half of common list. But one thing that common list doesn't have so much of is array processing functions. So in the course of building APL, I had to develop many of my own. cross This is strange. I could swear that a cross is in this file. One moment. Oh, that's right. So a cross has a special initialization for the environment, but uh, that's a bit much to get into. But anyway, what a cross does is a cross iterates over an array and it does something for each element. And the function that it uh, the function that it runs takes two arguments. Those arguments are the, the element value itself and then the indices of the element. So this is important for doing lots of different array transformations. So if you're like sorting elements, if you have like a five dimensional array and you want to make it into a five element vector of four dimensional arrays, then that's a, a use case for a cross. And then choose is another uh, key function here. So let's do the April demo.
April comes. So when I built the unit tests, I realized that they also functioned as kind of a language tutorial. So when you do April demo, the outputs of all the unit tests are listed and uh, along with some text that explains what they do. No, you're still on your slides and have been for the last few minutes. Oh. Thank you. So. <clears throat> this is so like I said, this is the April demo. When you enter April demo, it prints out a long list of uh, language demos, starting with really simple stuff and then getting into each of the functions. So the cho so choose allows you to select parts of an array with elision. So here I have this five dimensional array and then what I'm doing is I'm selecting, I'm basically eliding two dimensions, I'm eliding three dimensions of the array and selecting, you know, two, three, and two elements from the first, uh, the third and fifth dimensions. So that gives me this matrix. This is the kind of thing that choose allows you to do. And then there's more examples of this elision. There's assignment with elision and the choose function can be used to set things. So then a cross is used for functions like the partitioned and close. Really, it gets used for almost everything, but this is a good example. So I take this string and I turn it into a uh, this uh, three-dimensional array of these, you know, basically a character array containing these words. And then you can sort it, you, you know, you can basically arrange it differently by passing these different arguments to this function. But again, this is something you'd need a bunch of loops to do in any other language. In APL, it's a one-liner. So then let's look at section. So the section function is what powers, uh, earlier I was showing you the take and drop functions. So this lets you, you can either cut out a chunk of an array or you can actually take a, a smaller array if you take a if you make a take of the array that's larger than it is the area you know the new area gets filled with zeros so here i took a i stacked up or this is a well this is a mixing so this is the take so here i took the you know the famous glider from game of life and i added a bunch of, I padded it out with a bunch of zeros by making a take that's larger than it. This is a, here we have like a smaller take of a larger array. So this is a three-dimensional that's smaller than the bigger three-dimensional it was taken out of. But that's what you can do with section. So it lets you either take or drop elements from an array uh, as the APL function does. And then re-enclose function is specifically what implements the behavior of this uh, the enclose here. So the enclose function it basically takes it can take uh, an array or vector of arrays of one shape and then change it to another shape. So like I said you could take a five you could take a five dimensional array and then you could make it into a five element vector of four dimensional arrays using that or you could do the opposite but those are some pretty novel things in lisp that i haven't seen uh done before for general purpose
So talking about APL compilers, like I said, APL is traditionally an interpreted language. Lisp was interpreted at the very beginning, but it had compilers starting in the 1960s. APL has kind of been considered to be uncompilable. Partially was due to the, how the variables and the functions worked. Like I showed you in the uh, Emacs over here, If I do this, cf is considered to be a scalar value here, but if I make f a function, all of a sudden it's now operating on the five. So what f does depends on what you know what how f is assigned in the namespace. So that's a difficulty with compilation, and uh, you know doing things that aren't uh, in real time on an interpreter. So I I do keep track of these and I can uh, I can hand I can handle this, but it's been a barrier to compiler design in the past. So you can't implement absolutely everything that a stand like everything that a standard APL does in a compiler because APL includes some mainframe uh, functions like sending messages to other users. It was an entire operating system, like I said. So. You, you're not going to do that with an interpreter, with, with a compiler, but most of the language can be compiled. So there have been compilers since the 70s, and there's right now, there's a major research APL compiler called Apex. Amusingly enough, my original name for April was Apex, and um, I was contacted by people who knew the developer and the developer himself to notify me of this. So I ended up changing to April, which I've now decided is a much better name. But um, APL, so APL compilation has been around, and now Dialog is getting into it with a, uh, they're supporting a project called CodeDefunds, which is uh, designed by a guy named Aaron Sue, and he is basically doing a sig significant optimization on APL code using GPU. So that's, this is kind of the next frontier of APL. But the, like I said, the language has been surprisingly stuck in its ways uh, in a lot of respects. But uh, a lot, I think a lot of the users are in the mentality of it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So a word on code size, I got to talk to the Dialog guys and they told me that the size of, of uh, Dialog APL is about 500 k lines of code. And the core interpreter is about 100,000 out of that. So obviously they have a ton of plugins and add-ons. They've been adding things over the years for commercial users. So uh, hence it's quite big. GNU APL is, uh, according to its homepage, over 100,000 lines. It obviously has a lot of fewer functions than April and Dialog. It's just uh, hewing to the IBM APL2 standard, which only has like four operators. So with that in mind, uh, I'm interested to hear how many lines do you suppose April is? And please, uh, no cheating with GitHub. Any ideas? About 1% of that. Not quite. Is it 10,000? No. Yeah, there's in the chat, there's two guesses for 10,000 and one for 2,000. Not quite. Less than 10. You can't see my face right now, but I'm kind of shocked. <laughs> so according to the word count command, lines of code stand at 6350 for the latest commit. I'm not counting the uh, ASD files in that, but they would add like 30 more lines. So that's all the Lisp files within April. 
So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of what makes April tick. One moment. One thing that Lisp really helps with is optimizing compilation. So let's take a look at how this code gets compiled. So what this little line is, it's a, it's a very crude tool for brightening an image. So if, if you have a, an array of 8-bit, like an 8-bit PNG file, and you want to brighten it, you can multiply every value in the file by 1.2. And then this is the floor function. So it says, uh, make sure nothing goes higher than 255 and nothing goes lower than zero. And then find the floor of that. So you multiply everything by 1.2, then floor it all to the nearest whole number. And then you, you're, you've brightened an array of, uh, you know, 8-bit or 24-bit per pixel uh, colors. So when I compile this, it gives me uh, all of this, obviously. So I'm outputting this file, calling this, and then the you know the the omega is is wrapped you know deep in here, but you're multiplying it by 1.2 and then flooring it to 255, sealing to zero. You're you're, you're uh, minning it to 255, maxing it with zero, and then flooring it. So let's see what this looks like when I macro expand this. So what it does is it creates a single function that implements all these, implements the floor, max, min, multiplication, all in one, all in a single function. So what I'm, so because these are all scalar functions, so they're not operating on arrays, they're just operating on a single scalar value, or they're just a monadic function that has only one argument. Because of that, they can all be composed together. The crude way to do this would be, you know, first you multiply 1.2 by the array, you create another array, then you floor that array, you uh, min that array with 255, then you take that array, you, you max it with zero, take that array and then floor it. So you'd be making like five copies of an array, very wasteful. Instead, you could compose a single function and then map that over the array. And where that happens is in the apply scalar. Or wait, APL call. Yes, the APL call macro is where all of that happens. So you see the APL call macro is quite complex because it has this function compositing feature. And then underneath it, you see this little commented out APL call macro. So let's try evaluating that and then do the same macro expansion. And then I get this apply scalar, but still there's still an APL call inside there. So I macro expand that. And here we're getting that super slow use case. Every single uh, function is returning an array to the next one. Evaluate that again, 
And now this happens and notice that there's no APL calls inside here. It's all the actual fun calls. I talked to Dialog about this. They said that they have not actually implemented this yet. It's been envisioned, but this is one of the differences that Lisp makes. Now Dialog, of course, still has uh, an incredible amount of optimization, but this is just not one of the areas where they were able to do that. So it may look hairy, but it saves an incredible amount of time in evaluation. Then another really interesting quality here is the, uh, the APL grammar. So because April is so small, it's great for study by anyone who wants to understand how vector languages are put together. Obviously, if you wanted to go spelunking in the 100K lines of uh, GNU APL, it would take a long time to get your bearings, but in the uh, in the April code, if you want to see how the language is put together, the, the core of it really, if you want to see how the grammar works, the core of it is in grammar.lisp. So first it defines the three types of elements, which are arrays, functions, and operators, and then it sets up the patterns. Like there's a pattern when you just express an array, when you when you find a function. So these are the pat like these are the things that can begin a pattern, the things that happen at the, the very right end of the line. And then these are the following patterns that can come after the end of the line. So there are a few special cases, like the assignment glyph, the, the left arrow. That's a special case. It has to be handled. Uh, by the compiler directly because it could be used for a function or a variable definition. So this is where I handle function assignments. And then the branching, APL uses the right arrow for, it's kind of a, a branching logic, it, kind of like a go-to statement. It's actually not used much more in APL, but for completeness sake, I wanted to have it in there. And I kind of put my own spin on it. And then this is where you have uh, operator composition. Like for the inner product operator, that's uh, what I call a pivotal operator because it comes between two functions. So that's where this is handled. And then but lastly, we handle just the operation. But you can see this all happens in 363 lines of code. And the really cool thing about this grammar system is that you can extend it to handle special cases. So one of the keys to APL's performance is what uh, Dialog calls special code. That's when they have a function, like a specific idiom, that has a, a faster implementation in code. So one of dialogues, like if you look at their, so, well, let's talk about something, something that some people use as a crude APL benchmark is plus slash iota. That is summing the, uh, summing the iotas up to a certain value. Five. Let's do plus slash out of one million. So that was quick. And but the reason for that is uh, let's see what happens when I pile it. So I'm just doing a loop from you know zero to the number and summing. So Lisp of course has a low level optimization for this that makes it happen fast. And what I'm doing with this pattern is I'm looking, so I always look backwards because you read APL backwards. So I'm looking for the plus, the slash, and the iota, and then some form of array. And then I just produce this loop expression, that this loop expression you see here. So if I was to comment this out,
Let's see our time requirement. Try a bigger number. Okay, 1.3 seconds. Let's reload APL. Time it. Much better. And then this is a more useful APL idiom. So what this, what I'm doing here is I'm going to make a massive array and then I'm going to ravel it. That means I convert the array into a vector. I just take it apart in row major order. And then I'm going to rotate the entire thing around. And then I'm going to take the first value. So if you interpreted this literally, it would be incredibly wasteful. But all you really need to do is just take the row major a ref of one minus the array total size of this, uh, of this array. So that's what I'm doing. when I expand this. Row major A ref. So let's comment this out and see what happens. Not very efficient. Much better. I think that comes from the, uh, I think that this must come from the compilation, this, uh, this added time. But anyway, So what lies ahead for April? More optimizations, obviously. I'm looking into vectorization and GPU support. Uh, there's a number of areas to move into, but it depends what's most expedient. One interesting other thing that I've uh, developed is the use of uh, use of arrays in uh, Let me find this here. V, the VA ref function. So if you've ever looked under the hood at the way that a ref works, you might be surprised to find out that all a refs in Lisp are actually row major a ref under the hood. They just take the values that are passed uh, with a ref and then they multiply them according to the dimensions of the array. And then you get the, the row major a ref that the single number that corresponds to that to those numbers. Now, if you're doing a lot of array operations the way, like the way you do when you're using the across function, then you, like typically the common form that APL array transforming functions take is that you have an array 
You, so you know the size of your input, then you figure out the size and shape of your output array, and then you operate over each element of the input, you transform the coordinates from each of the inputs to the coordinates going to the output. So what that means is you're gonna have a list that holds the coordinates of each output. You're gonna transform the elements in that list and then feed them into the function that uh, sets whatever they're supposed to be at the output. Now, if you're using a list for this, that means that the, the access time to change one of the elements is on, uh, it's an on operation with n equal to the length of the array or the, you know, the, the, the depth of the element you're trying to change. So it helps to use vectors to store those, but Lisp doesn't natively support addressing uh, array elements by a vector. So that's what VA ref is designed to help with. So you take the array, you send a vector of subscripts, and that means that if you're gonna grab many different elements of the, of the array and you're gonna change that vector of subscripts, you can do O1 operations, and then uh, that's a significant, uh, sa significant uh, time savings. But I may also look into just uh, the other approach I was looking at, uh, if I could bring SIMD or, or uh, GPGPU into the equation, is to just make a giant matrix of every single um, with every single with the coordinates you know each row of that matrix would be the coordinates of every element in the array that's going to be transformed then the elements could be transformed you know that uh, matrix of elements could be transformed according to the uh what's going to be assigned in the output and then you could just use the use that array in uh you know make a displaced vector and use that as your uh, row assignments. So it's a matter of figuring out basically which of those approaches is gonna be best. Of course, there need to be a lot more compiler extensions. Dialog is so fast in part because they've spent decades writing the special code, the, uh, optimize, the optimizations, the common idioms. And then uh, the other thing, the other interesting quality of APLs that a lot of people don't know about is part of the key to their speed is using internal abstractions. And this is one of the reasons why they're sticking with interpreters because they can be very fast when they have this closed off environment. Because if you've ever tried to instantiate a trillion element array in dialogue, you can do it and you won't see any spike in memory when you do it because it's actually just, they're actually just pretending to um, implement that array. It's lazily evaluated. so. Uh, like in APL2, they have something called an integer progression vector. That means that when you do iota of 9 or iota of 1 million, it doesn't actually instantiate a vector containing all of that. It just instantiates an object that says, I am a vector of numbers from 1 to 1 million. So when, and then when you do an index on that, you know, it's easy to, to figure out what the 500th element of that array is. It's, it's 500. So you can... Uh, you know, using structures like that, you can save a lot in uh, you can save a lot in computation time. So that's another area I want to look at. Maybe get the line count above ten thousand. And then the last thing that uh, April needs is real use cases, which brings us to our next topic. So let's do. You know, we've all seen Game of Life. If you know anything about APL, you've seen Game of Life on YouTube. Let's do something a little more original than that. So here I'm showing an image with a set of letters from the traditional uh, Japanese arcade game font. This font was used on like the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, some other systems. It's kind of the ubiquitous old school video game font. Can everyone see this clearly? Yep. Yeah. Great. So here you have these letters. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to read this file. So I'm using the optical library to read a PNG file from uh, this 
location. See what this gives me. So when you read this file, you get a an array of eight by 760 by four. So it's eight pixels high, 760 long, and then there it's a RGB PNG image, and then there's a fourth alpha channel. So just to see what this is like. This is what I get. So the, the transparent pixel, see the black pixels here are actually transparent. So there's zero here and the others are, are solid white and full opacity. So this isn't very convenient to deal with. So we're going to do this step by step, just commenting some of it out. Okay, so to explain what I'm doing, I'm taking the I'm taking this font. What I do now is uh, I just change it. So I'm changing it to binary. So see, I, I'm taking the this is the leftmost edge of this of these pixels. You can see the ones here that corresponds to the exclamation point. So I'm just changing this to binary. So what I do is I multiply it. I reduce on the on the third dimension by multiplication. And then, so that's you know, multiply reduce, and then that's just uh, the factorial. So I, I give it to or the uh, the direct the sign or direction value. So it's just a one if it's positive, zero if it's zero. And that's what I'm getting here. So in Lisp, you can easily uh, print the output of anything by just doing arrow to quad. It's kind of like the equivalent of wrapping something in uh, print. In Lisp. So just like I can wrap this in print to print it out while I'm doing the operation, I can do a quad arrow. And it's just some you can put it in the middle of your code and it will the value it returns is the same as the value that was passed to it, just like with print. So this is a, a quick way to debug an APL. And then the biggest function here is the divide tiles. So what divide tiles do does is it divides, it takes the value eight and then it divides this long bitmap into eight by eight tiles. So each of those tiles obviously corresponds to a letter. And I'm, so the next thing I do is I print out the shape of that tile array and the shape is 95. So that means there's 95 characters here. I have 95 of these little eight by eight uh, binary matrices. And then what I'm doing is uh, this is V index of I. So the I, the input is the text testing. And then the V, this is the vector of uh, characters that correspond to these characters. So you see that the order here is the same as the order here. The second alphabet is supposed to be lowercase. If you, if you know, if your uh, pixel alphabet has a lowercase, this one doesn't. So both lowercase and uppercase become uppercase when they're rendered. 
So the next thing I do is I just I take this uh, I take the the tiles and then I gra I I grab the indices of the tiles corresponding to the indices in this string of these numbers. Then I just convert them back to their uh, their 24-bit color plus alpha equivalents. And I have to uh, I have to re I have to uh, reorient the array so that the last like uh, so when I you know when I stack them up and I make them into a, a three-dimensional array again, the three length the sort of the color vector or the color dimension comes first. So I switched around to be last. Then I write that to a file. So let's see the result. And we get testing. Let's try. So this would take, obviously, quite a bit more code to do in other languages. In APL, the core of it takes just a handful of lines. And this can be generalized and simplified even further, but this is just an example for today. But this has all been fun, but you may be asking, yes? Somebody was saying something. So this has all been fun, but you may be asking, what's the point of all this? Why you know, bother messing around with some pixels? A more pressing question you might have had for some time is, what is that thing behind you? So let's talk about that. Behind me is a device called Bloxel. And Bloxel is driven with graphics generated using uh, APL. It has a common Lisp jukebox system that uh, implements animations. And you can uh, basically, so basically the much more evolved form of that pixel manipulation I showed you is used to generate these graphics. So Bloxel is a, um, we call it a luminous structural display. It is a, a wall made out of these translucent blocks that have LEDs inside them. These are, are driven by this customized software I've created. And this is, uh, so you can have them follow music. You can program different kinds of interactivity with them. And it's all like the animation is all powered using APL. And using APL, I was able to iterate far faster than with any other technology I know of on these patterns. So going through this, what's behind me has just been our ambient, uh, you know, some of our ambient color patterns. But this uh, live stream that we did shows you some of the more sophisticated patterns that Bloxel can produce. This is the wave pattern. So Bloxel was scheduled to start going live this year and uh, doing a tour around some venues and uh, some different locations, but COVID obviously put a hold on that. So what we did instead was started a series of live streams. This is one of them. Uh, in our kind of mad science lab here, we've set this up along with cameras and some other equipment, some of which I'm using to do my presentation tonight. 
and you can see the uh, you know what we were able to do with Bloxel on camera. So obviously the you know the shape of these windows makes a great looking blur in the background when you photograph it like this. And here we have the Bloxel banner, so you can see the text Bloxel written over and over again in the background here. This video doesn't show you quite the full size of Bloxel. The main unit we have right now is 10 pixels high and 20 wide. So it's an extremely low resolution, but with four LEDs in each pixel, you can create color combinations within the pixels with a lot of interesting possibilities. And when you go that low res, you really need to figure out how to make every pixel count. So that spurred some study of pixel, of pixel art on my part. And really the key to pixel art is carefully choosing your color palette. So what I can do with um, April is creating palettes where you, you can change the palette in real time as the animation is going. So that's what's driving kind of the fiery and icy effects that you see inside these letters. And then let's look at, uh, yeah, this is the letters in the background here are an example of a, a classic palette rotation animation. So the, the colors in these letters are enumerated. You can see how they go from the darker red to the, the bright white. And you just take the list, you just take the numbers, you rotate them using that rotate function that I showed before. And then you, re, you, uh, you basically reassign the numbers in the array. So the rotation creates this kind of flaming effect that you see in the letters. And you can, you know, also the animation behind them, kind of the, the bubbly animation back there is also a palette rotation. So where APL really shines in all this is that the, these animations are done using, uh, you know, they're using a syntax in Lisp, which is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's it looks kind of like uh, you know an XML definition for an animation. You have the different things that are animated. You take the background graphics. So there's a you know there's a semantic framework that it's built on. But sometimes you want to step outside of that semantic framework and just do something arbitrary, like instead of having a you know a like a, a Lisp form with a long list of rules and conventions for deciding how to do a palette rotation or how to customize a palette rotation. Like if you want to, if you want to uh, drive a palette with a sine wave or something like that, I would need to, you know, in the classical way of programming, I would need to write uh, a bunch of functions and macros to do each of those things. Instead, I can do it in a single line of APL. If I was going to, uh, just do you know discrete one of a kind code using common Lisp for that? It would totally break up the flow of the program. It would be unmanageable. But APL not only allows me to create these more quickly, it allows me to better balance how they are defined in the uh, in the specification. Because when you want to do something custom and you can make it happen in one line, it's a lot more justifiable than if I was going to write, say, 25 lines of code to do one of these palette transforms. So let's take a look at the Bloxel website. The Bloxel website also features some patterns I made. I built the site itself, took the photos, and also uh, you see back here how there's this pixel animation. This is a vectorized, these are vectorized distorted pixels. So I generated an SVG file using CLWHO and then uh, created the pixel animation using April. So you have that animation, then you have this slider. These are photo. These are fisheye photos I took of the Bloxel wall, and then we have another animation down here with uh, distorted pixels in an animation sequence. 
And then this is from the same model shoot as before. The warm and cool gradation. And then at the contact us page, we have another fun little pixel animation. So these are vectors, like I said, very compact, totally scalable. And with a fun little animation that runs uh, as long as you view the page. And while we're here, let's play some of the patterns live. But behind me are those same letters that you saw before in the uh, in the live stream with the flame effect. So obviously at this resolution, letters are a popular, uh, a popular, uh, you know, medium I use. Here we have kind of a misty rainy pattern. fiery pattern. Some rotating orb things. These are the fire wheels that you saw before. Bubbly pattern. Kind of a glowing canyon pattern. waves and our Bloxel advertising pattern. When we're at it, we can look through the Bloxel pitch deck. So Bloxel demos. The goal is to kind of bring people back into the real world. We're absorbed in technology, so why not bring cyberspace and real space closer together? This shows you what the grid looks like, these transparent blocks with LEDs inside. The block, the common form factors, this is the big wall, the smaller wall. Individually addressable LEDs, displaying videos, sounds, images, where Bloxel could be of use, control systems, opportunities, and the next step. So that's basically Bloxel in a nutshell. So when uh, 
just about just as I was finishing development on April. Just as I was finishing development on April, I came in contact with the Bloxel team. So they had built this device, but they didn't have a programmer. They had some very crude graphics. So I was able to improve on that quite a lot. And it was kind of perfect serendipity. Just as soon as I was really getting April into its complete state, the perfect use case came along. So that's about the end of this talk. So uh, for now, let's open the floor to questions. Does anyone... Uh, have any any remarks, questions? Can you can you show us some of the code to generate some of those bubbling, flaming, whatever patterns? Show uh, some of the bubbling patterns. Yeah, the code that generates them. Oh, uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, part of the grammar there. Find one that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so here's an example of some of the uh, specs to, to uh, display the graphics. So this is like, this is for the bubbles, this is for the flames. So these just, in this you just take in, so for the bubbles it's literally just frames of animation from a file. So you have a file that con that contains multiple frames of animation. Then for the flames one, it, it assigns a palette. So I'm assigning this as the color palette of that, uh, that flame sequence. For the canyon scroll, again, this is, so what this does is the animation moves over the, uh, it moves over the, uh, uh, the sh uh, over the bitmap. This is another animation. And then this one has, this canyon scroll has a custom path. So this is doing some sine waves in the path. And then this is another undersea scrolling pattern that moves in a sine wave. So that's a simple example of how this works. So this is where you take the the kind of compositions that are defined in this file and build them. So a lot of it is pretty involved, but uh, 
gives you a basic idea. So when you have a lot of different things composited together, you can have custom rules defining how they uh, fit together. Okay, cool. That's pretty neat. I was just wondering if um, you're actually computing those kinds of patterns on the fly uh, rather than displaying them from an image. This, I mean, this is pretty neat, but uh, I could see APL being used as like a simulation kind of language, kind of like the game of life, to actually simulate these bubbles or fire kind of things um, being done. So in terms of real time, uh, I've done, like, originally I actually was doing everything in real time. So these are used to generate kind of they're like PNG files that are used as index. So I use PNGs actually as indexed color. Then I grab color palettes from a spec and I display them on screen. But yeah. the original way it was done was I did generate graphics in real time, but that uh, obviously when you get, you know, there's very, there's a lot of variability in the performance and the, you know, the frame rate, depending on how much you're doing. So at, so the, at first I did that. Second, I did, I uh, reduced everything to, uh, to, you know, videos that had variable palettes, but were otherwise static. But now I'm getting back into the, uh, the dynamic generation. It's just that it has to have more constraints on it than just, you know, do anything and put it on the screen. Sure, yeah, and you probably have to, maybe we'll, you'll find some uh, optimizations to add to the compiler in the process. Yeah, yeah, this, the entire experience has driven a lot of compiler optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's good to have a, a test case to learn, you know, what the, you know, because, you know, the, otherwise it's just premature optimization, right? Yeah. So right now, the, one of the goal, like, I'm looking into... I'm figuring out if SIMD is even going to be worth bothering with compared to GPU coding. There is an array, there's a, there's a library called ArrayFire for C and C++ that does super fast array handling. That's what was used in the APL compiler that's being developed for Dialog called CodeDefunds. So that may be the best thing to wrap with uh, April to seriously improve its performance. So I'm, I'm looking into if vectorization is even worth bothering with in the face of options like that. There's also libraries like uh, BLAS and LAPAC yeah. for linear algebra. So those could also provide a boost, but it may not be worth bothering with. Uh, yeah, I think the linear algebra stuff is more like, like you know, LU decomposition, stuff like that, multiplication, matrix multiplication, like bundled up rather than the the simple base operations that you're going to want to do in APL. Yeah. Right. Well, APL has matrix multiplication as well, so there are some of those uh, yeah. there are some of those operations that you do uh, in APL also. Right, but like a lot of the stuff you're going to do is not going to be just simple multiplication or simple linear algebra kind of stuff. It will be a little yeah. more, a little more fancy. Yeah. Yeah, there was, uh, there's already been, with some help from a developer named uh, Nikolai Matushev, I've done some uh, optimization of the, uh, a bunch of things in April, like uh, some of the, like the across function, actually, that's really the heart of a lot of uh, what April does. If you look in the code, you'll see that just about everything that does array handling works with across in some way. So uh, optimizing across has been one of the priorities. There was so do so implementing multi-threading for across is something that I started, but it still has some bugs. So at some point, I'm going to dust that off. So CPU multi-threading, whatever I do in with GPU or uh, or vectorization, CPU multi-threading is going to be important. So it's a matter of getting some of those uh, kinks worked out. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the immediate priorities is getting the CPU multi-threading working. Yeah, well, that, that'll yeah, and then and then right because what happens on the GPU is going to be a lot more straightforward, right? Um, it's going to be more operating on the particular computation kernel 
rather than the across, which might be like selecting the part of the the data structure that you're actually trying to operate on, right? Is that yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So across the way that uh, the way that makes the most sense to do it is you do you just divide the array into equal parts. Do row major, you know, you do row major a ref over each section of the array, and you assign each section to a core. Mm -hmm. yeah. I worked for 1010 Data for a while, and I asked Adam Jacobs, you know, why aren't why doesn't K3 do things on the GPU? And the basic answer was, it takes too much time to move things off and on it than it does to uh, than it does to uh, then it then you gain by doing them there. Right, and maybe that only applies when you're actually into the ten to the tenth, you know, size of arrays like they are. But um, I, I throw that up to you, just uh, you know, to consider. I think that I think that's going to apply at any size. So, when using the GPU, you have to make sure that uh, your workload makes sense for it. Now, some of these uh, array operations I'm doing are going to be graphical. So, if they can be output through a graphics card, then it uh, it makes perfect sense to use GPU code, but if not, then um, just the vectorization and multi-core could provide better what, than what the GPU can. Because I, I was looking at how to compose these uh, small resolution pixel graphics. Now the GPU is is it's great for composing things. It's great for you know putting multiple transparencies on top of something. GPUs are really not made though to work with indexed color. Like, you know, I'm using color palettes the way that old video games did. Uh, the, you know, the images are indexed and then I assign them colors from a palette. And GPUs can do this, but it's not really the use case they were uh, designed for. So apparently, uh, like in the current generation OpenGL, the functions that make this easier deprecated. So it, uh, you know, I've been looking at, is it more efficient for me to just stay off the GPU entirely with this? So thus far that's what i'm doing i'm not using gpu for any of the composition operations for blocks i think i think for Bloxel, it may not be the right use case right for the gpu kind of stuff but i think in general that stuff you do with deforesting the uh the computations right removing the intermediate um operations i think if you do that that will that will sort of avoid the the need to move stuff back and forth between the GPU and main memory because you're going to be doing lots of operations. You can like chain together those operations on a, a section of the data, um, yeah. and then on to the next section of the data, right? Um, you may be able to actually extract much more value out of a GPU than a compiler that doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, obviously combining operations is a big gain. Uh, it it really if like if you want to look at some of this in uh, if you want to disassemble some of this code yourself, uh, it's worth taking a look at the effects that some of this has on the assembly that's generated uh, when you compile this. I have a question. First off, I just want to say thank you so much. This was uh, awesome presentation. Um, one of the best I've seen in a while, and I watch a lot of talks. Um, so you said this was your first uh, sort of com attempt at a compiler and that you've been working on it for the last five years. So my, my first question is, what uh, what are the resources or like sort of what's your story? Because it seems like um, you've implemented a large subset of the functionality. Um, like I had a bunch of questions of how many of the operators did you have implemented and uh, you know, what rank matrices do you support? But like, as you were showing it, it was pretty clear that you had support for a lot of that stuff. Um, so mm -hmm. like, what are the resources? Were you, were you looking at like the J source code or were you reading certain books or? I didn't, I, I didn't read any source code uh, for J or, or anything like that. So I just um, like, I used GNU APL, I used uh, Dialog APL and I used, uh, what was it? The the old micro APL uh, manual. So I used the manuals for those three things. I read the, the specs of these functions. I developed an understanding for the differences between Dialog and APL2 and the different functions that they support. I decided that I was mostly gonna follow after Dialog 
and um, the resources were were basically like I looked at array operations. I experimented with the interpreters. I saw how they did different things. Uh, you know, I looked at like like that array operations library for Lisp. I saw how they had started to implement some of this stuff, and then I uh, I just worked from there. So, like I said, everything got re-implemented a few times. It wasn't you know it wasn't really five years. It started in in 2017. So it's been like maybe well late the end of 2017. So it's been two years and some change, and about five months of real uh, intensive work on it. So that's you know that's uh, that's the story basically. I uh, there was a lot of pounding my head against the array mechanics. Uh, the across function was a big breakthrough when I figured out uh, you know that approach. But yeah, you know, that's just that's basically how it happened. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, a follow-up question is: um, It wasn't mentioned. Do you have support for uh, any of the train functionality in APL, like the forks, or they also have hooks in J? Um, or have you put any thought towards that? They're known as combinators in different languages, like Forth or stack-based languages. Um, uh, when you talk about trains, I think I remember that terminology. I think it's uh, like. The classic example in APL is when you have basically uh, three functions juxtaposed uh, where the first and third function are monadic mm -hmm. and the second function is dyadic. Um, and the classic example is average. Mm -hmm. So your two monadic functions, the first one is sum and the third one is length. And then the dyadic function in the middle is divide and you apply your monadic functions to an array or your input. So you're summing up the numbers and then you're taking the length of the numbers and then with the results of those two monadic operations, uh, you pass those along to the uh, binary or the dyadic function. So you end up with the average of the numbers in a list. That's just, that's the, the classic yeah, example often, that you, you see. You use the, the, the right tack to do that so you can, uh, you, you you can basically differentiate between what should be evaluated before the function that comes after it. Yeah. Ba so basically, yeah, uh, trains, forks, hooks, all of this, uh, and as combinators as they're known in other languages, it's just yeah. uh, basically like a cute syntax for avoiding parentheses so that you can yeah manipulate yeah, that, the yeah. precedence of the way things are being operated. Yes, that is supported. Okay. Cool. And did you find that difficult having to support that or was that pretty straightforward? Not really. Uh, it, so I completely rewrote the Lexer and compiler at the end of 2018. Uh, my first attempt was pretty sloppy and I was having to build more and more special cases. But if you look at the grammar, you can see how all that is handled. So the train is really just a logical extension of the function syntax. So when you have uh, well, when you have the the uh, right tack, that just acts as a function that returns whatever comes to its right. So it's just uh, you know that it's just impl it's just uh, implemented as a function, understood as a function. Awesome, thanks. And once again, yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I want to mention for other people's benefit that there's a website called tryapl.com, which uh, gives you a virtual keyboard and, and access to an APL interpreter online. Yes, that's uh, that's from Dialog. So right. also, if, you real, if you'd like to learn APL, uh, there is a website. Dialog has a learn APL website. So let me see if I can find it here. I posted it in the chat earlier, um, but yeah, it's, it's tryapl.org to be specific. Yeah, sorry, .org, not .com. And I've seen a preview of uh, like tryapl.org 2.0, and it looks super, super cool.
So this is the Dialog APL Tutor. This is what I use to learn APL. So technologically, it is incredibly primitive. Uh, Dialog told me that it, it literally runs on DOS. It was written in the 80s, and they've been just keeping it alive ever since. But pedagogically, it's one of the best programming teaching tools that I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, it, it's quite, it's clunky to use. You have to kind of get the hang of it. But the way that they present the language and the concepts is just first class. And it's actually, I tell people, if you want to learn any vector language, the best way is to start is with APL. Because I started off looking into KDB and the Q language that is used with KDB. So, like, there's the K language. And KDB also has Q which is, it's like a vector language that also includes some uh, SQL query concepts. But if you're approaching them from a standpoint of algal languages especially, and even from Lisp, it can be quite confusing how they work. Because it's basically APL, it's like the APL style with some other stuff grafted onto it. But if you start by learning APL and you understand, you know, its simplicity and straightforwardness, then the uh, like the languages that came after like K will make a lot more sense because what they did with K and those other languages was they uh, they wanted to reduce APL to ASCII and that was like the J language was what Ken Iverson did in the 90s because uh, APL just wasn't getting anywhere on the PCs and the the other popular computing platforms because they they had to support the character set like one of the early APL solutions uh, was actually, one of the early APL solutions was actually to have a specialized Hercules graphics card with a physical switch on it that when you flipped would change all of the funny Microsoft characters like the smileys and the card suits and that to the APL character set. And that was the best solution that existed for APL on PCs at the time. So it was seeing no uptake. Iverson decided to release an all ASCII APL. And the result is that, uh, well, it's kind of a combinatorial, a combinatorial problem because there just aren't enough ASCII characters to represent the breadth of options that you have in APL. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of operators on operators that uh, yield more functions. And the problem he was trying to solve was actually kind of went away in a few years because then Unicode came out and all of a sudden you had access to way more characters on, uh, you know, on a, on a, a common PC. So, you know, some people will get the keyboards with the actual APL characters printed on them, but I learned just by using the, the GNU APL key map and after a while it just becomes second nature. Most of them have mnemonics that make sense, like rho is on R, iota is on I, the circle for pi is on O, and so forth. But um, yeah, so the to me, APL and its character set really have yet to be matched because when I see the rows and iotas, I know exactly what's going on. When I see a bunch of code in K, uh, you know, I might have flashbacks to Perl or remember some other use that those ASCII characters can be put to. Yeah, that um, I had to make flashcards to teach myself the K, um, mm -hmm. the K the K uh, mappings because um, you know not only are there things overloaded, uh, monadic dyadic, which is fine, but they're also overloaded overloaded by type, and in a way that you know has very little to do with the, the overload. You know, is is kind of meaningless. Yeah, um, the K when when you get um, the uh, there, there's an example on the K Wikipedia page. Um, Actually, for K, a very fun website is... Yeah, there it is. Two bang bang seven bang four, where the the rightmost bang is modulo division. The next one is iota, and the one after that is rotation. Right. I mean, that's just insane. So, no stinking loops has many fun K examples.
So like he was saying, a lot of these characters are overloaded two, three times for different purposes. And then, like he was saying, the other big distinguishing factor between K and APL is that APL is not strongly typed, K is. So with K, you know exactly what your variables are, uh, number of bytes. In APL, it's, uh, you know, it's, weak, it's more weakly typed. So one of the issues that I faced in APL is uh, getting the output format right. So thus, I actually I, I built a system where the arrays that are generated can always be reduced to the most efficient for holding what they have in them. Mostly as a lark, it's still the it's still the default, but I'm uh, probably going to switch that to you to just use T type arrays, and then have the option to output at a given uh, at, at a given array element type if you want to, when you're uh, getting data out of of April. But that option could also be switched on if you're going to use seriously gigantic arrays or if you really need uh, efficiency as opposed to speed. So any other ideas, thoughts? Uh, I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the application of uh, your language to uh, you doing um, sound manipulation instead of graphics. Have you ever oh, certainly, I've been I've been thinking about that already. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually been doing some playing with uh, MIDI music, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, creating MIDI loops. But you could also apply it to raw sound waves. That's cool because uh, we had a talk a couple of years ago about live programming um, and I actually, uh, or live coding. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but essentially it's kind of a performance art where you're, you're, you're writing code and as you're writing code, you're manipulating either graphics or sound and there's an yeah. audience that actually watches the person perform. And um, I saw the languages that they were doing it in, but looking at, um, using APL, I, I, I mean, I would say like one of the limiting factors to live coding is the amount of typing you need to do basically. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't, I don't, let me ask you this. Have you, um, I guess you're familiar with live coding. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts about applying your language to as a, as a live coding thing? I think we just need like basically a uh, fast eval to actually just change whatever's going on. I love it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it definitely looks uh, really fascinating. And also another comment, uh, just looking at it, I, um, just following the presentation, I would say, I, I think the theme to me is that uh, that really, um, this really shows the power of uh, Lisp. The fact that you can generate, you know, I'm, people talk about Lisp as the, uh, pro, uh, you know, the, the, the language to write programming languages in. And I think you've really demonstrated that um, to a T, just by the fact of how concise the code is, um, how readable it is, um, it's really uh, it's really impressive. So uh, that's that's my thoughts on it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this this is the power of Lisp. Yeah, it, uh, I could not have done this with any other language. And then uh, you know, I think it could be invaluable as a tool for anybody who'd like to understand vector languages or compilers in general the the grammar system you know i haven't looked at a lot of others but i'm pretty happy with the grammar system i came up with and it could be obviously like to get to dialogues level i'll need to write thousands of more of those uh special code uh optimizers but that wouldn't be that won't be too hard given uh the way this works but the you know the difference between dialogue and april the 500k lines versus well, yeah, in terms of it is 1%, like uh, that one, like one of you uh, guessed, when you look at it uh, compared to Dialog's complete lines of code. But I mean, let's be a little fair. Their core interpreter is 100K lines. So I'm sure the 500 has tons of the cruft that they've built for different commercial clients over the years. 
but that's uh, you know that's again the weakness of the uh, the monolithic interpreter model is that any external source you want to talk to has to be built right in. With Lisp, you can you know talk to databases, APIs, download stuff from the web, uh, do all of it, and with external tools that are specialized for that, you can just format it as an array and feed it into APL. Yeah, and, and like, especially if like if it's a lot of branching logic, whatever that's harder to write in APL. You can sort of switch back and forth between the two languages. I guess you're storing everything in Lisp arrays anyway, so yeah. it you know you, you don't have to do any kind of you know massaging of the data structure if it's just an array. So yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, logic. You know, logic is where you do is where the, the Lisp shines and semantic things like the you know the markup languages that have created for doing the graphics. They uh, you know they just look it just looks like a, an animation spec. But then in the middle of that, you can have some APL to do some low-level pixel pushing. Exactly. And, uh, you know, then you jump right back into your high-level semantics when you don't need to do a, a special case function. Yeah, I think that's that's the beauty of having these. Like, you know, in Lisp, it's not it's not like you just have an embedded language and you write code in the embedded language. It's you write code in both languages at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty different from... A, you know, a, uh, a Lisp, uh, uh, the typical Lisp DSL. Like someone asked me once if I'd used reader macros for it. Building APL with reader macros would be pretty nightmarish. But in this case, you just uh, you just compile uh, strings of code. So it is important. Yeah you, could, yeah. you could add a little reader macro, like a little tiny one, right? To just like like a hash APL. Or you can actually use like like maybe do like hash quad, right? Like mm -hmm. to, to make it even even more cute, right? To say to say like hash quad is um, introduces a, a, you know a, a string of APL code, right? That's just it's just the the uh, the, the operator you have for for um, you know to, to you introduce could, the APL code. You could, right? yeah, that would be fun. Uh, if you use a character that's only in APL, then that that makes it clear that this yeah. is, uh, this is APL that's coming after. Right, so like the quad, I guess, is kind of a very typical APL, like a distinguishing APL character kind of thing. Oh, uh, and then one more thing uh, we can go over is this is the April repository. So it goes over a lot of what I've talked about. It has examples. Uh, one thing that's it's important to know is the April F command. So April format will actually uh, produce an, a printout in the style of APL. So this is your output that's printed in Lisp style. This is printed in APL style. Excuse me. So this is, yeah, like I said, this is printed in the, uh, the APL style. Oh, and if you want to see probably the hardest part of April to write, take a look in APL esque and go to Array Impress because that is the function that does the printing. So printing APL is not a trivial task. This function is heavily commented because uh, every section of it needs to have uh, every section I really needed to remember what was going on. But for those of you who'd like to uh, try understanding how this printout works, this is where to do it. And then if you, I think I was talking about the, so to test April, you just run April test. And that runs all the tests, 40, not 491 of them so far. And then what I did with the tests was I just changed how they print out to do the April demo. And this prints out a demo of every function and operator in the language. 
I'm not sure if we're still supposed to be looking at oh. the GitHub page. It sounds like you're typing. So to reiterate, this is the uh, array impress function. So if you do April dash F to print something, uh, it will, April, the F stands for format. So it will print, produce this APL style printout. So this is APL style of array printing. It's a lot simpler than Lisp style because they only have a couple of data types, no, lit, no difference between lists and arrays or anything like that. Uh, so they can get away with a lot more simplicity. So this is the APL printing style, and then following that is the actual return value from Lisp. So array impress prints out. Uh, so, so then uh, to see how this printout works, you can look at the array impress because it, this has to be capable of printing nested arrays, uh, character like mixed character and number arrays, lots of other things that have special. Um, conditions on how they print. Uh, floating point numbers, negative numbers have certain conditions associated with them. So all of it happens inside this big function. What is the maximum rank that you support? Uh, whatever Lisp supports. I think the maximum array rank, at least on the SBCLs that I've used, is 2 to the 16th power minus 7. So that's actually, I think if I'm not mistaken, Dialog only supports up to 15. Yeah, like I think it's 15 max. Most of them have a fairly low limit on rank. Yeah, I, th I think in practice, if you're going above like 10, you're, you know, you, you probably have the resources to write your own compiler at that point, right? Yeah. Like, unless you're doing something really like weirdly theoretical, right? But if you're, if you have, actual big chunks of data that have 10, you know, t that's a 10 dimensional matrix that then you're, you're getting more into the, the supercomputing. Well, not so much. I mean, uh, if you're doing, um, you may end up with very high dimensional sparse arrays if you're doing machine learning. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. There can be like, you can use, uh, yeah, you can use dimensions, um, in certain ways to such that yeah you end up with a lot of dimensions you know because you're trying to classify things along those dimensions and actually literally put them in the array along those dimensions yeah it's very convenient to be able to represent a 1024 dimensional array as a 1024 dimensional array yeah. <laughs> now bear in mind the lisp maximum array size means that you can't if you're going to be a, if you're going to have a super dimensional array it can't be very uh, long across those dimensions. Yeah. yeah. But you could all, like, I think the, uh, you can compile SBCLs that have higher limits. As yeah, long I think it's, I mean, what, what's going to happen is that, that your memory management gets a little wonky because the garbage collector then, you know, or there has to be a lot more space outside of garbage collection to allocate the array um, contents. So it, things might get a little tricky when it comes to memory management if you, if you go too far with that. Yeah. So, okay, so like I was saying, uh, that uh, the array impress, that's the printer function. So to test April, you just run this April test and it'll spit out all 491 tests. And then what I did was I realized that the tests also serve as a kind of documentation of the language. So if you do April demo, it will produce a demonstration of each function. So April demo shows you, you know, these are the very basic operations. And then there are examples of each function going through the simple scalar functions into the array functions, the enlist, the find. Like this where function, this is one of the dialogue exclusives. Dialog just added it a few years ago. So Ravel, 
this is there's a lot of uh, Ravel has a lot of options. In APL, you can add, see these axes here? These are kind of a third argument for a function. Usually it tells you what axis of the array to operate along. But this, you know, this axis like this is Ravel along the second array. And then you have the decim. You have these decimals for even more options. So this lets you, this is a laminate function. So you put, you take the, uh, you take the dash character and you laminate it underneath here. To create a two-dimensional array and then you can also laminate vertically if you uh you know if it's a decimal value over one versus under one and so then this lets you you can turn a course you can turn a one-dimensional vector into a column a two by one or a, a one by n column and then this is that take you can also use it to basically stack up arrays of differing sizes and fill the empty space with zeros. You can drop, you can, uh, well, you can use this to split up an array into, so you take this three by four array and split it into a vector of three four element vectors. And then you can also use the drop function like I showed earlier to uh, remove elements from an array. And then this is the enclose, it lets you basically kind of rearrange an array, like rearrange an array or an array of arrays into a different configuration. This lets you basically divide an array according to some scheme. This can actually just uh, grab the first element of an array or disclose something that's uh, enclosed in a, that's like a one element vector intersection and uh, union of arrays this is the rotator this thing just rotates on the first rank or like vertically instead of horizontally and then this is the transposer that I showed when I was doing the uh, the character operation the you know the PNG image creation this is your matrix inverse and matrix divide the grade up and grade down are interesting. They kind of arrange something in numeric or alphabetical order. Or give you the indices of something in numeric or alphabetical order. And this lets you com uh, convert from, uh, you know, this lets you encode to a base. So you can do hexadecimal. It's also useful for converting. Uh, you can take a three a three byte RGB value and convert it to a single integer. So if you have, you know, if you're if you're working with uh, color, it's uh, very useful for that because you can so like finding all the unique colors in an image in Lisp in uh, APL is literally just like five characters using this. So you just take a PNG file, you encode it so that the you encode it along one axis, so that the you know, the three byte combinations for colors are just converted into one color. Then you use that union or unique function to find all the unique colors, and then you can do a row of that to find the number of unique colors in the image. And that's uh, all you have to do. It's uh, quite a bit more code in any other language. And so these are the special functions. These are the operators, like this is reduction, like I said, reduce along the first axis. This is scan. So, you know, you just add the sum of the previous one to each one, scan, you know, addition scan. This is each. So, like normally the iota, it only takes a single integer, but you can do iota of one, iota of two, and iota of three using the each to basically map a function over each of the contents. You can also use each with just uh, the regular old arithmetic op operators. The commute uh, can be quite handy. Commute is actually a way to avoid parentheses as well because it can put something on the other side. It can you can basically take a single value and put it on the other side of where you would have to put parentheses around something for some monadic operations. Key is kind of like a a SQL query, inner and outer product, the compose. This lets you basically combine functions to make bigger functions. 
So um, row of row is rank, obviously, because the row is the dimensions, and then the shape of the dimensions is the rank of an array. So you can do you can compose row and row together to make a rank function, run it on this three-dimensional array, and you get three. And then there's lots more stuff you can do with row. You can row together, uh, or not, you can do the jot. They call this the jot. So you can jot together a bunch of functions to make bigger ones. This is the rank operator, which is really handy for, uh, like, if you want to add a vector to each subvector of an array, you use the, use the rank one to do it. The power operator, actually, this is one thing that I didn't completely implement because power operator has an inverse mode where it uh, create it implements the inverse function of whatever you put in, and it means a ton of special cases. And there's literally you literally have to write cases for every single function in the language, and some of course aren't invertible. But uh, and then there's the at sign, which is really useful. It has like four different things. It basically you can like say assign like for every value that's a five in this array assign it to be a nine or add 10 to it or for every value where a certain function equates to true and by the way in apl true so true and false in apl is just binary so if you want to do true versus false you do one versus zero so anything that evaluates to zero do an op or anything that evaluates to one do an operation on that element of the array otherwise don't do that operation and then the stencil operator, another new one, which uh, you can use for like uh, convolution kernels for graphics and stuff like that. Oh, and then the other, one of the things that uh, distinguishes April from the other APLs is that I have brought a few elements of K into the language. So here we have k-style if statements. So APL classically has not been very good for logic. Now Dialog has solved this problem by bringing in a much more verbose language. They call them something like functional expressions or like uh, yeah, flow expressions. But basically what it means is that you can have like, they, there's a, you know, a verbose syntax with an if colon then colon but it's really not very APL-ish. It's not like what you would expect in a vector language. So I, so what I did instead is I just implemented the case, the case style if statement, dollar sign axes. The first argument will evaluate to one or zero, and then what comes after it will eval. You know, this is the true, this is the false. So this lets you write a simple monthly payment uh, mortgage calculator. With, oh, and then, so with k-style functions, I explained how the functions in April are either monadic or dyadic. But k allows you to have multi-argument functions. The way it works is when you declare your function, you put this uh, these brackets, and then you name the arguments. So in this one, I have three arguments. Then the way that this function is called, you don't put, a, you don't put the alpha and omega to the left and right. Instead, you put an axis after it, and you put in with the brackets and you enter each of the three values. So that's a concept from K. It was quite easy to add to April. Um, the APL vendors, obviously, they're, they just, um, they haven't uh, really done anything like this yet. But I try to keep to, I try to hold to the uh, monadic or dyadic functions when I can, because one quality of these functions is they cannot be used with operators the same way that a standard APL function can, because the operators are all designed around the idea of monadic and dyadic functions. So going to the n argument functions would break how APL operators work. That's one reason why the vendors haven't done it. So you just have to be aware of that. And then also the branching, like the go-to type logic that APL has, I changed the grammar a bit and I added a few features. But that's basically demonstrated here. You can play around with it. But yeah, that is some of what uh, that's some of what makes April unique. But you can uh, you can download it right now and just start messing around once you figure out how to get uh, APL input working on your computer. So, uh, any more questions, thoughts? Have you thought about like other like uh, um, 
uh, inputs, like especially for like Bloxel, like uh, uh, you know, like th th there are some like DJ AMA uh, uh, keyboards that have some pretty complex inputs that I'm pretty sure you know, like a little APL keyboard, like you know, to control like the lights behind you, you know, th th that might actually be like a reasonably like ergonomic thing. I've already got uh, MIDI keyboards working with Bloxel, so MIDI is pretty easy to read and Lisp. Uh, there's a MIDI library, and then MIDI produces a series of, uh, you know, just a, a list of properties like, you know, the note number, the speed, the it's uh, note, velocity. You know, it's like, it's like note and velocity. Those are the main values that you have coming from a MIDI keyboard. And then um, I use those right now. I just have a set of patterns of ambient color patterns that I uh, that I run over the screen. But there's any number of other things you could do with it. And I'm looking into like one of the areas that I'm uh, that I've done work on is designing customized color gradients using different color spaces. Like most one thing that you'll notice about a lot of LED art and LED installations that are out now is most of the colors they generate are simple combinations of red, green, and blue values. You'll see the red, green, and blue. You'll see the teal, the purple, the yellow. These are you know pretty simple combinations of red, green, and blue. But the thing about doing, and a lot of them use math in the RGB space to generate color shifts. So the thing about the RGB space is it's not proportionate to human vision. Uh, obviously we have more receptors for green than we do the other colors and less for blue so the blue you know shifts in blue blue is always going to appear darker than the other colors so i've been using spaces like the lab color space and uh, i've actually written a, a suite of convert like converters that have been adapted into apl there's actually an excellent color processing library for common list called duffy d-u-f-y um from a Japanese developer named Hugo Ishimaru. So he's got like all the uh, conversions from lab to XYZ to CMYK to RGB, QRGB. So I take, I, I, I've basically ported those into Lisp and now I'm trying out different functions to generate gradients through the lab color space. So I don't have any, I don't think I have any of that really set up in a displayable condition right now, but um, you know, it's all about creating kind of gradients that look pleasing to the eye and uh, generating customized color palettes. So that's a lot of what I'm focused on with Bloxel is uh, really when you have a low resolution, you want to have a lower color palette too. Because one thing that pixel artists notice is that if you have too many colors in a pixel art piece, it becomes muddy and washed out. The key is to restrain the number of colors and have only so many. So that way, uh, you know, your the graphics just have more of a pop to them, and the lower the resolution, um, like this back here, the the more the more of a you know small number of contrasting colors you need to get that that uh, that pop. Awesome. Also, also wanted to say, you know, like I, I've wanted this, something like this to exist for about as long as I've known APL and Lisp, Lisp existed. It's like, yeah, this is yeah, intensely cool. Well, why didn't you do it yourself? Because <laughs> because because I didn't really know a, a li li Lisp that well, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, um, and also not 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 really li like a developer, like a uh, you know. Uh, data scientists mostly with like uh, Python and pandas, and then like when I found out like oh this is where like uh, you know, Python came from Lisp in a very serious way, and you know pandas came from uh, APL in an even more direct way, and just uh, the, the, yeah, it, it would be cool. related to NumPy. Uh, uh, uh yeah, um, uh, so um, uh, uh, uh yeah, uh, 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 pandas is uh, um, yeah, like uh, it's built it's built on top of like the the analytic stuff. Uh, or the, the uh, you know the, the the numeric stuff in NumPy, which which is calling like blast and lapack and stuff, um, uh, uh, um, but like it's it's more for like you know manipulating panel data in general, um, uh, and has love can be and uh, um, you know it's it's more like a a, um, a, 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 a APL uh, uh, the the individual that uh, created pandas, his name is Wes McKinney, and he used to work at a company called AQR, AQR um, and he was heavily influenced by J, which is like the daughter language of APL. Right.
So pandas actually has a lot of methods that directly take their name from APL. Like it has a reshape and a bunch of other ones. Right. Very cool. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, what I noticed about the vector, about like NumPy and also like GLSL, it's like, you know, kind of, well, GLSL is like the most amateurish attempt at a vector language ever. It's like, you know, we have some operations over arrays, but I don't even remember, but there's a ton of limitations. And I just never understood why APL wasn't used for more of this stuff. Now, it, it was used graphically, like parts of Tron were actually made with APL, the movie Tron. But uh, you don't hear about it now, even from even in the areas that would benefit the very most from it, or any vector language, really. Well, I mean, uh, but MATLAB. I mean, uh, also, I think arguably, what like 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 came from APL, and uh, you know, and 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 and, and, and now pandas. Like so, you know, and I think it's also interesting because like there's kind of a divide in like uh, the developers and like the people who you know like aren't coders, but you know like learn like a little bit of a language in order to uh, uh, you know do what they do in just a more um, uh, 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 you know a uh, 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 pr programmatic way. So you know like developers don't use MATLAB, you know like and uh, yeah we're we're starting to see like those tails like come together again. Um, uh, 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 yeah, with stuff like uh, um, uh, 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 pandas and Python, but like. Uh, um, yeah, the, yeah. It's, it seems like the the, the tracks kind of got separated. It, it's, it's also like a kind of a uh, we're, we're in kind of an alternate reality where like uh, um, you know uh, Oracle are the only people who have you know uh, an SQL like thing going on. Yeah, but like uh, that's kind of the equivalent like universe uh, uh, that we're in. While you know like a uh, yeah, you know, uh, my understanding was that uh, um, you know. Uh, 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 um, APL was kind of famous for people who really weren't programmers who got confused with like, you know, assignment statements, you know, like were able to actually, but you know, like new uh, mathematical models, you know, could like express what they were thinking, you know, in, in APL and just, yeah, you feel like you could have like a full like data analysis language with, you know, without having to worry about it, you know, really knowing it, how to code in, 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 in a real sense, you know, with just like SQL plus, a, um, yeah, a plus an APL thing, you know, if it was actually, you know, open source and could talk to things flexibly. Yeah, the, well, the really annoying thing about learning programming is having to deal with the contexts, the boilerplate, and everything that distracts from your task and you have to do to get your code integrated into the system that it's, that it's working in. So APL, obviously, there's a bare minimum of environment, especially to the interpreters. But uh, some of my other work, like including my previous presentation on the seed technology, was about creating a better way to kind of package the programming experience and distill it down to just what you need to do to accomplish the task at hand. Um, like seed, for those who haven't seen it, it's a interactive graphical software environment that runs in the browser. So seed with seed, uh, you can use uh, you can use APL to write filters in a Photoshop like web application that transforms an image. So that uh, that composited function I demonstrated, the, the crude, the one that crudely lightens an image, that was part of that. So uh, seed right now is being extensively rebuilt. The uh, like the input output graph function functionality like seed was really the first big project that I didn't lisp. So with having learned a lot since then, the input output graph technology and some others are being uh, rebuilt uh, to be a lot more elegant in their design. But once that comes back online, especially with some of the new React technology, uh, that could open some interesting areas in terms of getting APL out to non-programmers. APL also is really, uh, it's really been successful in teaching children how to code. If somebody doesn't have the bad algal habits, it's a lot easier for them to pick up something like APL, whereas if somebody has been uh, using C, then APL can really throw them for a loop. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like the the pixel, like the, the vector versus raster, like analogy is kind of like logo versus APL, right? You can mm -hmm. kind of, or maybe you could build something on top, like a, a derived language from uh, APL that has a lot of operations that will make um, so speak, building raster images really easy. Speaking of derived languages, I didn't even mention the probably the most interesting function, the most interesting thing that you can do in April. So if you go all the way to the bottom of the spec file, you'll see this commented code, extend vex idiom.
So what does this do? This literally extends the April idiom that's specified here. So just like how you have specify vex idiom, you can extend that idiom with another function. So let's do that. It says extension complete. Yeah, they're extended idiom April with two lexical functions and one utility function. So this is just an add three function. It adds three to whatever you give it to. So let's evaluate this, 80. So this is not a very useful example. But what it boils down to is you can add your own custom glyphs and custom functions. You can change the functions from this spec. So all the functions and you know all the basic utility functions that make up APL, that make up the April language are here. There's very little in the VEX spec that, uh, you know, that implements significant APL functionality. It's almost all here. I was, I worked uh, to get everything that was remotely APL specific out of VEX and into the spec. So you can reassign these functions using that extend idiom. You can reassign these glyphs to be something different. You can basically make, uh, you can extend the language, you can include April in a package, and then in that software package, make your own extension of April. One, a good, you know, a good use case for that would be if you, like I was talking about converting between different color spaces like lab and XYZ and, C and uh, CMYK and HSL. So if you created glyphs to do those conversions, that would be obviously a, a more a simpler way to accomplish it than have like right now I have uh, nine character function names or I think six yeah like seven or eight character function names for each of those conversions. If you were going to do some a lot of graphical uh, work, you could create custom glyphs for those uh, you know for those color spaces and then use those to do the conversions. So. That way you're, you know, you're expediting a specific workflow. And this is a feature that I know of in no other APL interpreter. Obviously, you could hack GNU APL and add some functions, add some, add some operators. But uh, that would be, uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's a way that you could do that easily and extensively. With this, uh, you know, your extension can ride along with the development of April. And unless April makes a pretty drastic change, your extension will probably keep working for a good while. With uh, GNU APL, you'd probably have to do some plumbing in the internals of the language to add new, to add new glyphs. And then, um, you know, be a much more involved process to change anything. And then of course, in dialogue, it's not an option at all. And then, and then beyond that, you can, you basically can, uh have two different packages extending it in different ways and still be able to, like you can still, from a third package, call functions in both of those other packages, right? You can yeah. still, you can yeah. use yeah. those little, like you, each of those extensions can be used separately, even if they're not compatible with each other. If they don't layer nicely on top of each other, you can still write code in one, write code in the other and make that, you know, and then glue it together using Lisp. Yes. So does this mean you can you can basically um, you can basically bind any Unicode character or any Unicode symbol character to uh, to be a, a new April operator or function? Yeah, anything that you can uh, paste in here. Be aware that some have caveats, like the uh, period obviously has to be preceded by a backslash. The where is the umlaut? Yeah, the umlaut needs a backslash before it. So some things might throw you for a bit of a loop. There's a little bit of weirdness in the Lisp handling of some of the some obscure Unicode characters. But yeah, I was I was thinking of like a, I was thinking of some sort of Buddhist inspired one that used uh diet that used like vocabulary from Japanese Buddhism to somehow convey array concepts. That way you could have like a a kanji based uh programming language mm -hmm. that would be fun probably yeah. actually want to, be, to be alphabetic characters like which is what they really are but um 
but there's so many symbol characters in, in Unicode. I mean, you know, for everything. Emoji, obvious example. You know, uh, use an emoji to represent a, a, uh, some function or other. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, an emoji language would be way fun. <laughs> yeah. Two things I thought of. Uh, one is that you should probably count the number of right parentheses at the end of lines and add them to your uh, to your uh, WC um, line count because, you know, that's the fact that we do that in Lisp and they don't do that in C, you know, ex uh, inflates the line count in C, having all those braces on separate lines. Oh, uh, well, that would be rewarding them for using C, and I don't think I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> they should be punished for their bad syntax. <laughs> there's nothing, you know, there's no reason why you can't use lots of right, you, you can't cuddle up all the right, right braces in C the same way you do in uh, in Lisp. Yeah, your IDE will just prevent you from doing it. <laughs> I love those IDEs that literally, like, prevent you from writing in certain situations. Now, I write Lisp in EX, excuse me. And occasionally I go into VI mode, but most of the time I stay in EX mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I use gzip-dc to write my code, so. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've told people, you know how you know that you're an APL programmer or a K programmer is when you use uh, Twitter instead of GitHub to publish your code. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So uh, there's a question from the comments uh, from Larry. Uh, do you run this on a laptop or on some computer like a Pi? Uh, I have run it. I have run it in. Uh, oh, if you're talking about the Bloxel. So the Bloxel has a Raspberry Pi, which directly drives the uh, the uh, pixel, the pixel drivers. So that Raspberry Pi has a server on it, which is um, I push the pixels to that server from a laptop or computer or a larger computer, which is what drives this. So I have uh, gotten a I have gotten April working on uh, what is it uh, closure common Lisp, which runs on um, uh, which runs on uh, on uh, Acorn or. Uh, Uh, the name of the processor is uh, well, ARM, right? ARM, yeah, yeah, it run, yeah. So, SBCL doesn't run on ARM. CCL runs on ARM. It's slow and clunky, but it does work. And once it gets up, it's pretty responsive. But I don't, uh, and I have test. Like if you look on April, I've tested it with most of the main Lisps. The only real problem is like Lispworks doesn't like some of the characters that I use for the unit testing. But that's just a cosmetic thing. So. But yeah, it works on the major Lisps. I've tested it on uh, many different systems. So it uh, even armed bare common Lisp supports it, although it can really chug at times. But uh, so the, but yeah, the, the Bloxel, the plan is that the Bloxel is going to, so the Raspberry Pi, it can display discrete animations. Like if you just have a saved animation, it can do that fine. Doing things on the fly, like interaction with music, um, stuff like that. That's where it starts to tax it. So the plan for the Bloxel is that the Raspberry Pi is essentially a backup display driver. The main display driver is a small computer, like one of the like the little Lenovo Mini Blade computers that will be tethered to it, and then will present a web interface that people can use to uh, basically select the animation like from a jukebox, and then the uh, if the if the driver computer fails, the Pi can uh, basically do auto. It can basically run automatically and fill the gap. So it'll just automatically play animations if the driver computer fails. And then the the other upside of that is if one of those computers fails, the user can ship it back to us. They can drop ship it, and we can overnight them a replacement that they can plug in and start working again immediately. So that way, there will be nothing inside the Bloxel unit that needs, you know, the most failure-prone part will be outside the main unit where it can quickly be swapped out.
Does um, <clears throat> anyone else have a question? Um, there's a. I seem to end up singing at these meetings, so uh, I wanted to sing something very short. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so this is this song is by RMS, who of course is uh, has oh, considerable the APL, the with. APL song. What? Is this the APL song. It is, yeah, the short one. Sure, yeah, let's uh, have it for the record. Okay. So it's. Row, row, row of X always equals one. Row is dimension. Um, yeah, row is dimension. Row, row, rank. KPL is fun. Yeah, I think he composed that in the 60s. But uh, yeah, uh, RMS, from what I recall, he wrote a word processor in APL. Hmm. Which was uh, kind of an early project of his, but I'm kind of surprised that no one has really tried to compile APL to Lisp yet. The Lisp machines had compilers for many languages into APL that they had C compilers, but no, uh, no APL that I know of. Even though, actually, like I think one of the functions in Lisp, I think one of the like hyperbolic arctan was defective because it was mistranscribed from APL. So there was a lot of, uh, there's been a good deal of crossover between the two languages, but no one has brought APL into Lisp yet. Yeah, I, th I think the whole Lisp array library was basically like, what, how, how similar can we make it to what APL provides? Um, and obviously they didn't, they didn't go crazy into like providing all the slicing and dicing kind of functions. Um, yeah. But just like, you know, providing, you know, arbitrary rank and, and all the different operators that operate in certain ways on the arrays. Um, yeah, well, the row major ordering, uh, that was, that I think that it's pretty clear that was taken from APL. And it's one reason, it was one thing that made it so easy to uh, port APL into Lisp is that the, the basic way the arrays work is the same. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, what was I saying? The, uh, something about array mechanics, but, uh, well, yeah, APL, oh, yes, uh, well, one of the most interest, one of the most useful things that APL doesn't really have due to its nature, but one of the best array features Lisp has is displaced arrays. For anyone who doesn't know about those should uh, check them out because it's a really handy way to uh, efficiently derive like vectors from a larger array that's what I was looking to use for the concept of taking all the coordinates in an array and then transforming them into an array of the output coordinates and then grabbing each of the sub vectors to assign your uh, element from one array to the other. But uh, displaced arrays, that was a really handy concept. And the, the whole row major A ref as well, because they, like, they clearly understood how arrays are structured in APL and wanted to follow that as close as they could. Yeah, I think I think it was largely intentional, um, because I think uh, was like Fortran is column major, right? So I think they explicitly diverged from how Fortran did things, even though the original Lisps were built on top of Fortran. Mm -hmm. right? They basically they were they were interpreters written in Fortran. Um, well, the very first was assembly language. That's where we get the car and cutter from. Yeah, well, I think I think even before that, I think uh, I, I don't know. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think McCarthy was basically trying to build a sort of symbolic library for uh, for Fortran. Mm -hmm. well, and there, then, there is such a thing called L FLPL, but um, but I don't know of any Lisp actually written in Fortran. There's a pro the original prologue was written in Fortran. It's true. Okay. Right. I think originally uh, APL, about the Fortran. First APL compiler, I believe, actually was written in Fortran. Okay, yeah, that makes sense too. So APL compiling has been an ongoing project for some time, but it's you know there in some accounts you read that APL compiling is impossible. Yeah. Which, 
I mean, if you take all the message passing functions and the mainframe stuff, then yeah, that you can't compile that. But sure. in the core language is definitely compilable. I, th I think it's because of that that deforestation stuff that you're doing. Like it, it required people to. I think that a lot of that was sort of invented because of Haskell, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the sort of functional language kind of paradigm. They were like, well, if we're going to be writing things this way and and not, you know, we don't want to be able, to, we don't, we don't want to be like unroll loops, you know, write, explicitly write loops. We want to write operations over struct over streams of data. How can we optimize that better? And I think a lot of that was perfected in in Haskell compilers, right? Because like what you're doing is, is actually like almost a simple case of that in that you're, you're doing that on an array. They are doing it in an arbitrary sequence, you know, mo uh, sequence of, of, a, of a monadic operator, right? It's it's all, all the data that may come from some IO device and then be filtered through some other operation that picks out the things that are sensible for processing by the application and then, um, you know, gets processed by the application code. And so... Uh, good Haskell compiler will go in and instead of obviously it can't it can't loop over all IO it has to actually find that path through that the code that is actually being executed um, on each individual uh, element mm -hmm. right and so sometimes that involves looking backwards looking for forwards um, it involves uh, you know combining things at certain levels all kinds of weird stuff like that right you might also want to look at series because series might be might have some of the optimizations um, that you haven't implemented in your um, in your in your unroller. Yes, series is a library. It was actually Appendix A in Common Lisp language um, in the original spec for for Lisp before it was uh, you know submitted to ANSI, mm -hmm. um, and so that is basically it's 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 basically in a, in a uh, like lazy sequences and stuff like that, um, but it can compile down. It, it compiles down to like loops. Not it doesn't compile necessarily down to the loop operator in Lisp, but um, it'll it'll compile down to like a, a tag body go kind of thing, where, right? Um, and and it, so it'll analyze the entire structure of everything that's happening in right. that code, and and it does some funky things with like with like compiler macros and stuff, and it stores away some definitions and then when you try to compile something it'll actually effectively inline all the, the functions that you've composed um and figure out a way to unroll it into uh, uh instead of keeping all those intermediate da data structures just uh unroll it into a loop a lot like you did in, in what you were doing um but i think there may be like things where it, it It'll optimize for for like skipping items and things like that in a in a very efficient manner as well. Right. And yeah. Like tag body is, right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely something worth looking at. Tag bodies are actually what I use to implement the branch statements in uh, right. EL. Yeah. If you look in the grammar dot lisp, you'll see them there. That makes sense. Yeah. Because that, that's effectively what that is. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, <clears throat> We've been going on for about three hours now. I think we can keep going, actually. But uh, I think we have to end the stream now. Um, I want to thank you, Andrew, for uh, presenting uh, APL to us. Uh, I think everyone appreciates it. Uh, I just want to give you a round of applause on that. Um, uh, yes. And um, so I think we'll conclude the uh, live stream. Just stay on, uh, and then we'll have another message to get. Yeah, thanks so much.